Okay, so here's uh, the new topic for today. Well, so we're um, done with chapter five now. Uh, moving along to chapter nine, uh, you may notice that's a big jump. Uh, chapter five is a uh, chapter that's mostly about linear algebra. Chapter nine is the other chapter remaining on our syllabus that is also mostly about linear algebra. So the the choice that I'm making here to ch skip chapter six for the moment. Um, is just uh, based on that connection, you know, we're in the middle of doing some linear algebra. Why don't we just go ahead and finish doing the rest of our linear algebra? Um, better to have more linear algebra tools. Um, when we get around to doing the applications of linear algebra, namely in chapter 6, technically we could get away with not doing that. The book, of course, does chapter 6 before chapter 9. Right, um, but uh, uh, like my predecessors uh, in this class, I'm going to uh, uh, do it this way and give us a little bit more uh, to work with. Um, okay, so um, uh, what's going on here in Chapter Nine? We're going to introduce a new sort of abstraction called an inner product space, uh, and I want to start off by reminding you a little bit about uh, what is an abstraction. Um, so uh, we've seen. Uh, the construction, a certain kind of abstract construction already in the form of vector spaces. Let me remind you what the idea was of a vector space. Uh, we look at Rn and we think, okay, um, there are certain algebraic features that Rn has. Um, you can add any two vectors in Rn. Uh, any vector in Rn you can multiply by a scalar. And then we make the observation that, well, there's lots of other things where uh, those algebraic characteristics are the same. So let's consider the collection of all, you know, functions of a certain category, let's say. Well, you can take any two of them and add them, just like you could add any two vectors in Rn. You can take any one such thing, multiply by a scalar, just like you could multiply scalars by vectors in Rn. Um, and uh, lots of other examples that we saw. Um, we saw that certain theorems that you can prove in Rn have uh, strong analogs in these other contexts, right? So the, my, my silly example that I started uh, section 2.1 with was a statement about linear combinations in Rn. And we proved it, stated and proved it in specifically Rn. And then we noticed, well, you can state and prove very similar looking theorem about functions. And you can state and prove a very similar looking theorem about uh, matrices and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it occurred to us the preposterousness of why are we calling these different theorems that are morally the same theorem? Right? So the, the big idea then is to notice that what we're really doing is in, all, in that context where we got all these different theorems that are kind of morally equivalent, what we're really doing is we're proving what you can do with merely the algebraic characteristics. And we actually, you know, what are these things, that, the fact that we're talking about, you know, vectors in Rn, or whether we're talking about functions of a certain category, or matrices, what the objects are isn't, uh, isn't really relevant in the proof of those theorems. It's the algebraic characteristics, right? So we define this abstraction of a vector space to be uh, anything that has certain key algebraic characteristics. And we deliberately never say what the objects are. Right? So, so the construction of a vector space, in general, deliberately vague about the objects are so that those objects can be anything. Right? We state and prove theorems about vector spaces in the abstract so that they will then apply broadly to every other context, every one of these other kinds of vector spaces that we enumerated, and more importantly, every other kind of vector space that we haven't thought of yet. Right. So um, common misconception, uh, I mentioned at the time, common misconception is that when you do abstractions in math, you're getting away from applications, and it's the exact opposite, at least in this context. When you are creating an abstraction in math, you are creating something that can apply more broadly. Right? And then, of course, then you're not actually doing those applications, but the point is you're creating something that has more applications. Okay, so uh, back from the very beginning of that, uh, we, uh, we were looking at Rn. We looked at certain key characteristics of Rn. 
Specifically, we were looking at characteristics of at R, of Aryan that uh, connected the things we've been talking about, like linear combinations and uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so the vector space construction includes, as its key defining characteristics, uh, those algebraic features we've been playing with. Vector addition, scalar multiplication. Because that's what allows you to do linear combinations. You might have noticed, perhaps, that conspicuously absent from that list of algebraic tools in RN when we were thinking about vector spaces. Conspicuously absent is the dot product. Right? Now the dot product is a powerful tool in RN. You can do some cool things with it in RN. Right? We made no mention of it in our definition of vector space. We didn't really need it in that context. Okay. So, under the heading, though, of, hey, uh, notice certain key algebraic features in Rn, define an analogous abstraction, and then we'll let her rip and see what happens, what kinds of extra applications come out of that. Let's play the same game now, but just uh, observe in addition to uh, what we already have, namely we can add vectors, uh, we can multiply vectors by scalars. What happens if we throw in uh, an additional operation, namely the dot product? Um, and uh, we're, we're going to create a new abstraction that models not only vector addition, not only scalar vector multiplication, but in addition, the, uh, the dot product operation in Rn. So we're going to be looking for things that behave kind of like this. Okay, so with that context uh, in mind, a uh, uh, couple of quick reminders about the dot product. Uh, here's the formula for the dot product in Rn. Hope you all remember this from Math 2.12. Uh, long ago. Uh, here are some facts about Rn that you may recall. By the way, of course, if you're a little bit rusty on uh, Math 212, if you haven't thought about the dot product in a long time, perhaps uh, this would be a good time to brush up, remind yourself of those details. Anyway, here's four properties uh, of the dot product. Um, here's three more. <laughs> Which brings up the question of why did I call these four uh, facts and then why did I subsequently call these three uh, more facts? I have a good reason for this. I'll explain why that is uh, soon. And here's another four. Still more facts. So again, question, why did I separate these? Uh, not, why did I not include these within either of the previous lists? I have good reasons. Uh, we'll come back and talk about that uh, later. Anyway, uh, make sure you recall all of these facts, more facts, and still more facts. Uh, about uh, about dot products. Okay. Um, now uh, a little subtlety that I have to get to. Uh, I uh, in this fourth property here, uh, what I have written as my fourth property is not the same as what the book wrote as its fourth property. Um, one could argue both uh, what I've written down and what the book has written down are true. One could argue that it's a subjective choice. I suppose, um, but it's going to turn out that the way the book wrote theirs is a problem, and I'll point that out when we get to the problem. Uh, anyway, specifically, uh, uh, what am I talking about? The uh, what the book wrote down in place of what I have here is that a self dot product only equals zero when the vector is specifically the zero vector. Um, what the book wrote down does not in fact exclude the possibility that a self dot product might be negative when the vector is not the zero vector. So they did not exclude that possibility. And what they wrote is still true. They're just not further saying, as I am here, that a self dot product is never negative. Okay. All right. So uh, <clears throat> here's what I'm going to do. We've got some algebraic observations about Rn. Rn has a vector addition. Rn has a scalar vector multiplication, and Rn has a dot product. Rn has a function that satisfies these four properties. So we're going to define a new abstraction now, a new abstraction called an inner product space. An inner product space is anything that behaves kind of like this. Just like a vector space is anything that behaves kind of like Rn in previous senses, an inner product space is anything that behaves kind of like Rn 
in these senses. So uh, to write that down uh, precisely, here we go. Um, we have to have a vector space. So we're still requiring vector addition. Scalar vector multiplication, that's still still, uh, still required. Furthermore, we're requiring a third operation that we're going to represent with uh, triangular braces separated by a comma. Yeah, so classical notation. Yeah. Um, uh, that satisfies uh, these four properties. These I'm writing down four properties that are just ripoffs of the first four properties that I wrote down on the previous page. Um, so in addition to the vector space operations, we need a new operation uh, called an inner product that behaves just like a dot product. And if you have this thing, a vector space with this additional structure, um, that's called an inner product space. Again, you know, the big idea is I just, uh, roughly speaking, you could say the big idea is my vector space construction only has so many tools. I would like to have more tools to play with, please, because I would like to be able to prove stronger theorems with my stronger tools. That's all this is. We're giving ourselves a kind of a dot product. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, our first example is a free example, uh, Rn using the good old plain old regular dot product is an inner product space. All right, now I claim this is a free example. Um, here, here's the, the broad brush stroke of how to think about this. Um, when I say that Rn with this dot product is the inner product, when I say that's an inner product space, what I'm kind of saying is that this behaves kind of like Rn. Yeah, well, sure it does. It is Rn. <laughs> so this being the model of my new inner product construction, of course it behaves like the model. It is the model. right? So no surprise there. Uh, the dot product, let's see here, uh, the dot product satisfies the four properties <laughs> that we wrote down to define inner products in the first place. Okay. All right. Okay. So here's a uh, here's a non silly example, and this one really is uh, pretty surprising. Uh, this is oh my gosh, this is such a powerful idea. Well, I'm going to be able to allude slightly more precisely to why this is so powerful um, as we go along uh, through this chapter. Never quite going to be able to really do the big examples, but uh, here's a vector space. C. I hope you all remember C. This is a vector space of functions, right? So, it, so C kind of behaves like R in in the sense that you can add things and you can multiply things by scalars. It's got that vector space um, structure to it. And now I'm going to define a new bit of structure. We're going to define an inner product by that formula. And this is a little bit of a weird formula. Let's take a moment with this. If you give me two vectors in C, so one function, one continuous function that is, another continuous function, here's my new operation. You give me these two functions, uh, what I'm gonna do with those two functions is I'm going to uh, multiply them and then do an integral from A to B, thus giving me a number so what we have is, you give me two vectors, out comes a number. That's just like what the dot product does, right? Think back to, you know, Ari and what kind of, a, kind of a function is the dot product. Two vectors in, one number out. Just like this. So um, it, for me to assert that this is an inner product, uh, namely that this behaves like a dot product. There is a little bit of work that has to be done. Uh, this is a good exercise for y'all to do on your own. Um, so I want to encourage y'all to, to try this. Show that this, as an inner product, satisfies all four of these properties. And you just have to go through one at a time and uh, just confirm that, yes, indeed, this function does behave as required. Um, a little bit of a heads up. 
these first three properties are pretty straightforward. Um, no big deal. Uh, just you know, think carefully, write it down, make sure you're clear on what you have to show, and basic, uh, you know, basic features of integrals. Uh, old Calc One facts are all you need to prove the first three properties. Um, however, property number four is tricky. You have to use more than just Calc One facts. You have to use the fact that these are continuous functions. The continuity is is critical. Uh, if you were to try to suggest that uh, you could use this as an inner product on f, keep in mind what f was. f was the collection of all just functions, no continuity given. On f, this is not an inner product. This does not satisfy property number four on f. You need continuity. So anyway, write it down, uh, think it through, try to come up with counterexamples, and uh, the continuity is the key feature. Um, it is tricky, though. So let me point out that, as usual, when I suggest exercises here in class, and if you have trouble with them, if you get stuck on something, um, come ask me in office hours, ask the TAs in office hours, ask in discussion section. This would be a fantastic topic of conversation. How does property number four get satisfied for that uh, candidate uh, inner product? Um, and there's some, like I say, some little details in there. Okay, something to play with. All right. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, as it turns out, this construction, this turns out to be a really important construction. Uh, this is called the L2 inner product uh, for reasons that I can't, uh, we don't really quite have time to go into, but uh, anyway, it's called the L2 inner product. Um, real quick, let me tell you a couple of things that we can do with this inner product. We don't have time to actually do these details. But uh, do you all remember, for uh, those of you who took Calc 2 here at Duke, if you took uh, Math 112L or Math 122L, do you all remember Fourier series? Fourier series, uh, which by the way, if you didn't see it in Calc 2 at Duke, you'll see it in Math 353. Fourier series uh, can be, uh, uh, that construction of Fourier series can be very strongly motivated with an argument based on this what we call L2 inner product. So this is very powerful in that sense. Creates Fourier series construction. Um, here's another one, and I really can't go into these details. It's a, a much more sophisticated, uh, modern thing. But uh, I'm sure you all are aware of this idea of image compression. Right? Um, well, there's a lot that goes into that. right? But one of the big ideas of image compression involves a certain very special inner product space. It involves viewing images as vectors in a vector space. Nay, inner product space. We have to define an inner product construction on these vectors uh, as images. Um, and uh, with that inner product defined, morally it's the same as this inner product. Some powerful ideas come up that are totally analogous to Fourier series. Uh, it's just a sort of Fourier series in a different context. And one of the big results of that sort of analysis is, uh, is image compression. So some of the ideas of image compression. So it's a really big deal. Um, this, uh, this is how, you know, Netflix works in some sense, right? Is uh, based on ideas that trace their way back to this inner product. Okay. Again, that's a very long conversation that we don't have time to go into, but I just wanted you to know that it's there. Um, okay. Um, here's another one. Um, <clears throat> there's your good old dot product. Now, uh, note I've written this in a kind of a weird way. Uh, that you, know, you could take two vectors, V and W, and I'll talk about their dot product. Here I've written it as a dot product of their of their coordinates with respect to the standard basis. Um, let me just say, well, yeah, well, sure, that's what we mean when we say dot product. We mean dot their coordinates, and in the absence of any basis to the contrary, we mean coordinates with respect to the standard basis. So what I'll point out, though, is that there is another construction you could take for any two vectors. You could write down their coordinates with respect to a different basis. You could dot those coordinates. You can dot their script V coordinates instead of their script S coordinates. Uh, these uh, formulas are not equal. These will not give you the same thing. Okay. However, this 
does give you an inner product. It gives you a different kind of an inner product. Um, and uh, this uh, idea is a, a, a very useful idea of nice applications in different contexts. Um, so uh, this is another uh, thing that you can check for yourself. This is uh, easy to check. Take this uh, function defined here. Confirm for yourself directly. It satisfies all four of these properties. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, heads up. Um, in exercise nine of this section, the exercise is asking you to prove something that is morally equivalent to this. So while you're working exercise nine, think about how you could make the uh, connection that the question in exercise nine is in fact equivalent to this question. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So reminder, here's our definition. Um, we require that you have a vector space. All the rules that come along with a vector space, two operations, eight properties. And then furthermore, in addition to that, we require a third operation, four more properties um, to be called an inner product space. Okay, those four properties came from here. They came from looking at these first four facts about the dot product. So let's, uh, let's go back and ask, well, why didn't I include the more facts? I mean, <laughs> right? If I want something that behaves like the dot product, well, the dot product does this. Don't I want my, anything that I call an inner product to also satisfy these properties? Therefore, should I not require that these properties uh, uh, be uh, satisfied as well? And a uh, certain point of view would say yes. Here's why I didn't do it. Neat fact. Any function that satisfies these four properties automatically, for free, satisfies those properties. Right? So I don't have to require them. I don't have to require these three more facts. Simply by virtue of requiring the original four, these come along for free. Right? So for example, I think you can uh, persuade yourself that something which is commutative and what you might call right distributive, wow, if it's uh, right distributive and if you can switch sides, not hard to see how you could persuade yourself that it automatically has to also be left distributive. right? So if I've already checked that this is true and if I've checked that that's true, I don't need to also check that. That's free. It'd be a waste of time to, for, to require checking it when I know it's already true. Okay. All right. Um, here's uh, another one I didn't write down, but uh, a neat feature of uh, dot products and also a neat feature of inner products. Uh, inner products are linear in each entry. Um, this is what we call a bilinear operation. It's kind of like multilinear. Y'all remember multilinear from way back when talking about matrices and determinants? Multilinear. This is the same thing, except there's only two inputs. Um, so when I say linear in each entry, let me talk. About, let me show you here uh, what we mean by linear in the first entry. This function, inner product with W, this function, inner product with W, if you put a linear combination in, you get the corresponding linear combination out. Linear combination on the inside, linear combination, if you will, on the outside. You get the same answer either way. So looking at this with the right side fixed, thinking of this as a function only of the left entry, this resulting, this purple, if you will, function, um, function of the left side vector, that function is linear in the usual sense. So. Um, <coughs> So this is what we mean by saying it's linear in the left entry, and then analogously, uh, this is what we mean by saying uh, whoops, this is what we mean by saying that it's linear in the right entry. Both of these are true, therefore linear in each entry, therefore bilinear. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, let's go back to our list. These are part of our definition. Well, these these motivated our definition. Uh, here, let me write this. Uh, let me write it like this. Okay, so these motivate our definition. Okay, these here 
are free. Don't have to include them in our definition. They're automatic once I've done the first four. So next question to ask, what's the deal with these still more facts? Are they also free? Do they automatically come along for the ride? Um, sadly, no. Well, then shouldn't I require that they be true? Uh, if I want a, my new inner product construction to behave just like dot products, shouldn't I require them to have these properties that the dot product has? I can't, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, so let me explain uh, what's going on here. The, the problem with this last group is these talk about how the dot product relates to geometric geometric constructions like magnitude magnitude, angle, right? We have no notion of magnitude at the moment in our brand new shiny concept of an inner product space. You know, again, consider you know, inner products of function, inner product spaces of functions like, uh, like this, right? Brand new notion of inner product. What do we mean by the angle between two functions? How can I check whether this inner product behaves in a nice way uh, with respect to the notion of angle between two functions if I have no notion of angle between two functions? Right. So I can't require these uh, as part of the definition because uh, this is a comparison to concepts that don't exist in my new context. Uh, they do not come along for free because, again, these are statements in, uh, with respect to things that don't exist in our new um, in our new context. So what I can do though is use my uh, my desire for these to uh, I would like to kind of bring these along for the ride to motivate new definitions. I'm going to use this to motivate a definition uh, definition of magnitude. There is no pre-existing notion of magnitude. I'm going to use this to define magnitude. And likewise, uh, looking at uh, this formula here, there is no pre-existing notion of angle between two functions or you know, matrices, what have you. So I'm going to use this as a definition of angle. That's the idea there. So here we go. Um, I'm going to define the magnitude of a vector in an inner product space as the square root of the self inner product of that vector in that inner product space. Okay. Okay. Uh, which, by the way, this is this is weird. Right, this is this is uh, geometrically a little bit freaky, right? I mean, if, if I if I talk to you about the magnitude of a vector, you, you think, well, yeah, sure, because the vectors, Euclidean vectors. I mean, I can see them. There they are. They they have a length that's the notion of distance, and it's extremely natural to talk about it that distance, that that uh, length as being its magnitude. But if I say, let's consider the following function, how long is it that that's we don't have such a pre-existing notion, right? So we are creating here a new notion where we previously did not have one. Um, a, 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 a cultural point, sometimes this is called a norm. Um, it just means magnitude, which again, conceptually, you think of as being like length of that as a vector. Okay. The, the analog in Rn would be the idea of length which, of course, we've previously called magnitude. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, here's a, an example. Uh, if you are looking at vector space of continuous functions, which we have souped up um, with not only vector space operations, but now our brand new additional inner product, our L2 inner product that we talked about previously, thus giving us an inner product space. Here then is what we mean by the magnitude of a function in that inner product space. Um, and there's some nice uh, there's some nice applications of this idea. We're gonna see some of it as we go along today. Okay. All right, um, analogously, in the same way that we use this 
to define a notion of magnitude. We're going to use this to define a notion of angle. Again, creepy, right? I mean, if I have two functions, what do I mean by the, the angle between two functions? We have no pre-existing concept of what it should mean to have an angle between two functions. It's just not a thing, right? It has not been a thing up to now. Now it is. Um, angle in an inner product space is defined to be the, the the thing that it would have to be to make to make it kind of consistent with the uh, with how dot products related to angle in uh, the Euclidean context. Okay. So uh, here's a uh, here's a nice example. Uh, let's compute the angle uh, between these two functions, uh, sine x and sine of x plus phi. Um, that's uh, angle in the inner product sense. In this inner product space, uh, C0. Uh, by the way, just a, a quick, uh, oh gosh, I'll say convention. Um, it, when, I, when I write down a vector space, like, like C0, uh, if I refer to it as an inner product space, or if I talk about an, an opera, a, you know, a concept, a construction that only makes sense with an inner product, you're supposed to assume two things. You're supposed to assume, first of all, that I mean this as an inner product space, and second of all, for this inner product space, you're supposed to assume that I mean the L2 inner product. The L2 inner product is your standard, uh, it's like your default inner product uh, for this vector space. Okay. Okay, so if I'm going to compute um, the angle between that vector and that vector. Well, I'm going to need to compute several things. On the one hand, I'm going to whoops, I'm going to need to compute the magnitude of that first vector. All right? So the magnitude of that first vector. Well, plug into the formula from the previous page. Magnitude is the square root of the Self inner product, uh, so that's an integral of the function times itself. That's just check back a couple pages back for a definition of our L2 inner product, and you find yourself doing this little bit of calculus. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, reminder, uh, let's see, this is math 216, so 212 is a prerequisite for this course, uh, 112L is a prerequisite to that course. And 111L is a prerequisite to that course. So doing these kinds of integrals is in the prerequisite trail of this course, and I know it was a while ago, right? I think a lot of y'all, for example, uh, uh, took Math 212 your first semester here, that being last semester, um, and haven't done single variable calculus since high school. Some of you possibly a couple of years ago, right? So I know it's been a while since you've done you know, Calc 2 integrals. Uh, I'm sorry to report that they're still important. Uh, the Pratt School has specifically asked us, how come is it that our students are getting into you know, mid-level, upper-level engineering classes and they can't do single variable calculus? They've forgotten all of their integration techniques. right? So Pratt has specifically asked us, don't let up on the Calc 2. Right? Make sure that students can still crank stuff like this out because this comes up a lot. Right. So anyway, FYI, um, you can't get away from it. Uh, you have to make sure that you're uh, good with your Calc 2 techniques. So make sure that you can work out this kind of an integral. Um, if you're rusty on it, you know, come to my office hours. I can uh, show you some some uh, quickie pointers. Right. Uh, but uh, anyway, make sure that you can do those. Uh, here's what it turns out to be, and ends up being that that magnitude is square root of pi. Um, details for you guys to check out on your own. Uh, likewise, we're going to need to compute this magnitude, uh, magnitude of that second vector, uh, W, uh, that magnitude, oh, whoa, that, mm -hmm, what's going on here? That magnitude um, is this, which is that integral. Um, again, top two, make sure you're good at it. Uh, that also turns out to be square root of pi. Uh, finally, you're going to need to compute the inner product of the first vector with the second vector. So uh, green with blue, that's a other inner product. And that gives you 
uh, this integral here. Now again, uh, don't forget your angle addition formulas. And make sure that you can work out integrals uh, such as this. Uh, this is a slightly more inconvenient than the other two, but it's not that bad. Not that bad. Um, and a uh, nice result uh, is, uh, is this. Okay, plugging that in. As it turns out, uh, this uh, inner product divided by the magnitude of the first one uh, divided by the magnitude of the second one Oh, I think I got those backwards. Not that it matters. Yeah. And uh, arc cosine of that uh, expression, and uh, look at that. What you get is phi as your as your answer. And uh, I'm going to say this is a nice answer, that theta is equal to phi. I'd like to talk a little bit about why that's a nice answer. Um, let me remind you what these are. What is phi? What is theta? Uh, aren't they just angles? Aren't... Why is this not obvious? Uh, perhaps. Okay, let's talk about well, what these things are. Uh, looking at uh, up here at the top, what is phi? Phi is, uh, well, the negative of phi anyway, uh, is the phase shift. It's the phase shift between these two functions. Let me draw a little picture. Um, uh, the two functions are sine x. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. So sine x, um, sine of x plus phi, something like that. Phi is the phase shift. Well, the negative of the phase shift. Okay. All right. What is theta? Theta is the angle that we're trying to compute. This theta thing is not an angle that you can point to on this picture. Theta means uh, angle thought of thinking of these two functions as vectors in an inner product space. Uh, theta is an abstract, brand new, brand newly defined notion of angle. So thinking of sine x as a vector, thinking of sine of x plus phi as a vector, Two vectors in our brand new inner product space that we can't even visualize geometrically because, my gosh, these are functions. Theta is that angle between the two inner product space vectors. These are space shift, right? So these are very, very different angles. Um, that said, I do think it's kind of plausible that they end up being the same. Let me uh, kind of walk you through a plausibility argument. Let's consider some scenarios. Um, what would happen if theta was zero? If theta is zero, we're talking about two vectors that are, in fact, exactly the same vector. Well, two vectors that are identical, the angle between them is zero. So highly plausible when phi is zero, <coughs> theta is zero. Sanity check, right? Now, uh, related example. What if phi is small? If phi is small, think about these two curves. We have this orange curve, this green curve. They're no longer the same functions. Therefore, they are no longer the same vectors in our inner product space, whatever that means. Um, but notice the values of the green function, the values of the orange function. Those values kind of track each other somewhat. So as functions, they are not that far from each other. They're very similar as functions. And so then as vectors in the inner product space, you expect them to not be terribly far from each other. Therefore, you expect the inner product space angle also to be small. So sanity check. When the phase shift is small, the inner product space angle kind of should be small also. Last uh, sanity check I'll give you. What if phi is pi? P is pi. That means that we're phase shifting by a half period. Okay, phase shifting by a half period. Now I appeal to your trig uh, confidence, right? If you take a sine wave and phase shift it by half a period, you get exactly the negative. You're doing like this, right? Well, now let's think about what does that look like in an inner product space context. If you have a vector and then you look at exactly the negative of it, Notice, as vectors, they are exact negatives of each other. And therefore, the inner product space angle between them, also pi. 
So again, sanity check when the phase shift is pi, the uh, theta, the inner product space angle, should also be pi. Okay. Okay. Okay, I hope you all remember the uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Uh, this is a, a topic that comes up in, in Math 212. This is a feature of the, of the Euclidean dot product. Um, <clears throat> the magnitude of the dot product of two vectors, absolute value of the dot product of two vectors, always less than or equal to the product of the magnitudes individually. Um, hope you all remember that again. Now, uh, this is a true fact for the dot, pro for the dot product in your RN. Um, this is one that we mention in Math 212 and then kind of quickly throw away because even more powerful, so it seems, in Math 212 is the, the algebraically more sort of the, you know, the analytically stronger thing that says uh, dot products are exactly magnitude times magnitude times the cosine of the angle. Right? And it's just more, it's a more powerful thing in Math 212, thus creating this weird situation of how come the less powerful result, or so it seemed in Math 212, is the one that has a name, right? And the uh, seemingly more powerful result is just, oh, you know, that formula about dot products and cosines, right? So why is that? Why did they give the name to the seemingly less powerful result? Uh, here's why. We couldn't tell you this in Math 212, but... Um, this inequality, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, does not just apply for dot products in Rn. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality applies for all inner products. It is a very powerful, it's a very broadly applying result. Every inner product has this feature. Um, totally analogous to what we see in, uh, in Math 212. So in Math 212, this looks like less. This looks like a seemingly, you know, like a corollary of the more powerful result. You're only seeing in Math 212 the tip of the iceberg. Here you can see how this applies to every inner product. And so, for example, let me show you what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality looks like for one of our other inner products. Uh, don't forget the L2 inner product. I'm going to write down the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for the L2 inner product. Um, the absolute value... Now let me write down the L2 inner product. Integral from A to B of uh, f of x, uh, g of x, uh, dx. Absolute value is less than or equal to. Now I'm going to write down a product of a couple of magnitudes. The magnitude of the first function is the integral from A to B of f of x squared dx, um, square root, and then times the integral from a to b, the square root of the integral from a to b of uh, g of x squared dx. So this is also a true fact. This, I mean, and what a, oh man, what a weird uh, calculus identity that is. Anybody remember seeing that calculus identity in Calc 2? No, of course not, right? Calc 2 does not have methods that will allow you to prove this reasonably, right? This is a, a, a very powerful uh, extension that comes only from using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality as applied to that specific L2 inner product. Okay, right. So, anyway. Okay, um, <clears throat> this, next, uh, this next couple of pages is an example uh, that uh, I enjoy going through. Um, it's a neat example that involves statistics. Um, it uh, is not essential. It's not in the book. Um, it's not critical to the course. And we're behind schedule. So I'm, sadly, I'm not going to be able to uh, go through this example uh, in as much detail as I normally do. Uh, I'm going to hit some highlights of it. Um, uh, I'm going to say if you have taken a statistics class, then you might want to take a more careful reading of this. Uh, think about how to incorporate this observation into your knowledge of statistics. If you have not taken a stat class but will, then I want to encourage you, as you go through your, your statistics class, where you learn about the objects that we're going to kind of very quickly just, you know, kind of toss around, um, think about this point of view 
as you're learning the statistics because it will give you a big mathematical advantage in learning about those ideas. So here's the big idea. Uh, again, I, I, so I'm not going to go into the details, um, but there are in statistics there are things called random variables and sample spaces and covariance and variance and um, standard deviation and correlation. These are all statistics concepts that talk about um, how random variables. Uh, how you can quantify certain perspectives on random variables. Um, so you can think about them in kind of what I'll call statistical ways and in terms of uh, trying to develop intuition about how, how these uh, values, how certain numbers, random numbers, sort of relate to each other. Covariance is one of them. It's defined by a formula that involves uh, an expectation value, what they call an expectation value, which roughly <coughs> means on average, kind of, what do you expect to this expression on average uh, to uh, average out to? Okay, so the uh, the big observation that I want to make here, and again, you know, if you've had a stat class, this may mean something to you. If you haven't, it won't, but be on the lookout for it. This thing, covariance, is an inner product. Um, and I'm going to have to put an asterisk there. Uh, there's a little subtle... Uh, subtlety that has to be dealt with. It's not a big deal. It's not anything you need to worry about. Um, so it's an inner product. Now, why would we care about that? You know, we have this, uh, you know, you can define covariance. You can talk about what it looks like in some, you know, uh, statistical sense and what it's good for. Um, here's why this matters. Thinking of this as a as an inner product gives you the following advantage. These other concepts variance, standard deviation, correlation, you can interpret them as in how they relate to covariance um, as other inner product concepts. And as it turns out, standard deviation then can be thought of, in fact, the formula for it is exactly the formula for magnitude and correlation as it turns out, is exactly the formula for cosine of theta. So the, so the big punchline then is the fact that you can interpret covariance as an inner product allows you to interpret geometric, excuse me, to interpret statistical concepts geometrically. You can come up with a geometric, not a statistical, but a geometric point of view on, uh, on standard deviation as a magnitude, and you can think of correlation in a way as giving you a notion of angle between two random variables. Um, what you can do with this is uh, very unexpected, but there are certain facts, uh, certain facts about statistics, certain facts about random variables that if you look at from a statistical point of view, if you look at this from a, from like a, from a data point of view, certain facts about statistics are really counterintuitive. They, they almost seem false. At a minimum, they're unexpected. But taking, instead of the statistical point of view, taking instead a geometric point of view, those same facts thought of geometrically are not only um, not implausible, they are borderline obvious. So there's a tremendous amount of value, a tremendous amount of potential to making to understanding statistics in ways that otherwise you simply couldn't. Um, if, uh, if so, like I say, if you had a stat class, maybe give a closer reading to these examples and uh, take try to take away a geometric point of view on on uh, on correlation. And if you, like I say, if you have not yet had a stat class but will, keep this in mind when you start seeing correlation. Look back at these pages. Think about it from an inner product point of view. Think about random variables. Not as data, but as vectors in an inner product space. Um, and uh, you'll find uh, you'll find that you have much more. You'll have an unfair advantage in some sense on intuition about how correlation works. Okay. All right. And of course, by the way, uh, as uh, always, if you're curious to hear more about this, uh, I'd love to talk about in office hours. Feel free to ask me in office hours, and um, that's uh, at your discretion. Okay, we have 45 seconds. Uh, there's no sense in going on from here. Let's call it a day. Y'all have a great weekend. See you later. Yes.